A little bit about history of fibers first, and then we'll go on to uh, some of the other good stuff. If I can find my notes. No, that's not in there. Okay. Um, I found some interesting things about his, uh, historical things about fibers when I was uh, doing some research for this. Um, the history that I found starts all the way back in 1664 when Robert Hooke, and I'm sure th some of you have heard of, um, made a suggestion that there should be a possibility of producing uh, artificial fibers, specifically uh, um, artificial silk. But it wasn't until uh, almost a couple hundred years later that uh, the first process was attempted. Uh, in 1855 in London, the first patent was issued to a Swiss chemist and uh, he was using, he extracted cellulose from mulberry based on the premise that silkworms ate mulberry leaves and such. Um, but uh, he formed his threads by dipping a needle into a pot of this goop that he made and drawing threads, uh, fibers out of it. Uh, he had not thought at all about forcing this stuff through some kind of a small hole or a spinneret to form the fibers. Um, in the 1880s, Sir Joseph Swan, who was an English chemist, did some experimentation with forcing this similar solution through a spinneret and into a coagulating bath to harden the fibers. Um, and he exhibited some of his experimental fabric samples in 1885. In 1889, a Frenchman named Count Hilaire de Chardonnay produced what he called fabrics of artificial silk at the Paris Exposition. And uh, this was uh, greeted with widespread appeal. Um, and uh, he opened, two years later, opened the first commercial rayon plant in France. In uh, 1893, cellulose acetate was first produced in Boston but it was produced as a film. It wasn't used or thought of um, as far as fibers are concerned. And then you have to go now to 1910 before uh, rayon fibers were produced in the United States, and that was the American Viscose Company, the first company in the United States to produce uh, rayon fibers. Uh, acetate, about the same time, so which is, uh, cellulose acetate was being produced in Switzerland in, in the form of movie film and a few other articles like combs and other plastic um, type instruments. Jumping ahead to 1924, the Selenese Corporation began marketing acetate fibers. And at this time, manufactured fibers constituted only 1% of the domestic fiber market. The rest of the fiber market in, the, in this country was made up of cotton and wool and other natural fibers. Going on to the next decade, Dr. Wallace Carruthers develops a fiber that he called 66, which referred to its structure. This later turned, uh, came out to be uh, what well, came to be known as nylon, especially nylon 66. Uh, he was doing polymer research at DuPont at the time. Uh, a few years later, in 1938, a German chemist named Paul Schlock developed or discovered the polymerization reaction of caprolactam, and that resulted in a material that eventually became known as nylon-6. And that filled a gap in the uh, polyamide fiber uh, series. It wasn't previously uh, known or developed uh, until that time. Yeah, the next year, 1939, Nylon was introduced by the DuPont uh, Corporation to the American public as a new miracle fiber and uh, as the first fiber that was, it was the first fiber to be synthesized in the laboratory from chemicals instead of derived from some other natural source. Starting in 1941, World War II basically shut down the av availability of nylon to the American consumer. Virtually the entire production of nylon went toward the war effort and it went through to making everything from parachutes to pistol belts, anything in between. Uh, silk became very difficult to come by since we were having problems with Japan at the time and uh, 
So they started uh, making parachutes out of nylon. Uh, after the war, in the late 40s, we got a few more types of fibers. Uh, metallized fibers were produced by Dow Badisha, which is now known as BASF Corporation. Modacrylics were brought out by the Union Carbide Corporation, and olefins were brought out by the Hercules Corpora Corporation. I'm not sure whether that's the same corporation that makes uh, the uh, gunpowders or not, but uh, that was, that's the name of the corporation <laughs> listed. Uh, by the end of World War II, manufactured fibers were now making up a whopping 15% of the fiber market, but it were, were, they were gaining. Uh, in 1950, um, DuPont brought out a new fiber type called acrylic. And uh, surprisingly, I don't quite understand this, but the references that I've found have monacrylics coming out before acrylics. I don't quite understand why that was. But uh, there's also some disagreement in some of my references. In 53, polyester was brought out by DuPont and several other companies that started manufacturing it, as well as triacetate. Then through the 50s and the 60s, there weren't too many major um, new types of fibers brought out, but there was a lot of modifications, improvements, and new uses found for uh, fibers, and uh, there were a lot of developments toward uh, making uh, clothing items and making these fibers more comfortable as far as clothing was concerned. They also were paying attention to flame retardants, uh, static reductions, soil releasers, and brighteners uh, for, the, for the new fabrics. In the early 60s, we have uh, spandex and aramid coming out, and these were uh, beneficial to the aerospace industry. Uh, they went into, a lot of these things went into production in, in uh, spacesuits and composite materials for aircraft. Uh, by 1965, manufactured fibers constituted 42% of the fiber market, and in the 70s, they reached 60 to 70 percent of the fiber market. And the last two major fiber classes that I was able to find were developed in the 1980s, and those are PBI, which is uh, polybenzamidazole, and sulfar, which is polyphenylene sulfide. So much for history. Um, Next, I'll go through the, some of the basic types of fibers, once again, but not from a historical point of view. I, part of your handout is a sort of a glossary and uh, some de you know, de basic definitions. If I mention something or somebody else mentions something that you don't understand, give us a yell and we'll try to explain it. I'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, acetates, first produced in 1924 by the Selenes. Some of this is re repetitive, I re uh, realize. Um, the FTC definition is a manufactured fiber forming, the fiber forming substance is cellulose acetate. And if 92% uh, or more of the hyd uh, hydroxyl groups in the cellulose have been acetylated, then that fiber can be called triacetate. It's generally produced by dry spinning, which means that the polymer is dissolved in some solvent. In this case, uh, acetate is dissolved in acetone for extrusion through the spinneret. And the spinneret looks sort of like a shower head. Um, with dry spinning, the fiber is extruded into a a uh, warm air current which evaporates the solvent away from the fibers, causes them to shrink and harden. Uh, uses for acetate are apparel, uh, home furnishings, uh, upholstery, draperies, draperies, things like that, and also cigarette filters. The next uh, fiber type is, that I have here is rayon. It was first produced in 1910, and it's defined as a fiber composed of regenerated cellulose. And um, not more than 15% of the hydroxyl groups in the cellulose 
chains can have substituents. If they are, it's something else, not um, rayon. Production, the viscose process was one of the first. Uh, the cellulose is converted to xanthate, and then it's reconverted back to cellulose as it's extruded into the coagulating bath. The coagulating bath neutralizes the caustic um, base that, the, that is used to solubilize the material and as it's neutralized, it converts back to cellulose and hardens in the coagulating bath. Again, mainly uses our apparel, bedspreads, blankets, draperies, sheets, etc. Also, he's used in medical and surgical products and tire cord. Acrylic fibers were first produced in 1950, and they're composed of at least 85% by weight of polyacrylonitrile. Uh, they're produced generally by dry or wet spinning. Wet spinning is what I described uh, for rayon. Uh, the fibers are extruded into a chemical bath, which causes them to set up and harden. Um, and acrylics are often modified to give special properties, um, the texture or something, depending on what the ultimate use is going to be. And the fibers are generally produced in staple or toe form rather than in monofilament um, form. Uh, staple fibers are, for those of you who don't know, fibers that are extruded and then after they're produced they're cut into specific lengths and then they're spun into yarns and they have most of the yarns, if a, you see a yarn that has a fuzzy appearance, it's generally because it's a staple fiber and the ends of these little fibers stick out from the yarn after it's spun. Uh, toe, toe fibers are fibers that are extruded all out together, but they lay next to each other. They're not wound or spun into a yarn, generally. They're just allowed to sit um, in long groups all together, and then they're woven into fabric that way. And next we have aramid. Okay, aramid is a similar fiber to nylon chemically, <clears throat> but the difference is that at least 85% of the polyamid linkages are attached directly to aromatic rings. And uh, one of your things in your handout gives some um, uh, examples and shows you what the chemical structure of the important linkages are in the molecules. Uh, aramids are generally spun as multifilament yarns, and it's a, apparently a uh, proprietary process from DuPont, and my reference didn't have any more details other than it's spun as a multifilament yarn. Mod acrylics, first produced in 1949 by Union Carbide, and um, the difference between them, uh, acrylic and mod acrylic is that mod acrylics have between 35 and 85% and polyacrylonitrile, and they have a lot more of, or can have a lot more of other type of material uh, in them, like polyvinyl chloride or polyvinylidene chloride uh, as a copolymer with the uh, acrylic. And uh, one of the purpose, purposes for the mod acrylics was to get a fire retardant or fire resistant material um, and one of the, several of the mod acrylics are specifically um, done for that purpose. And uh, these fibers are dry or wet spun. Now we'll come on to a little bit different processing. Nylon, 1939, was first uh, produced. And uh, it's a fiber where the, the fiber forming substance is a polyamide with. Um, without the high per percentage of uh, linkages directly to aromatic rings. It's uh, mainly produced as nylon 6 or nylon 66, depending on the process that they make it from. Nylon 66 is um, a copolymer between hexamethylene diamine and, and uh, adipic acid, whereas nylon 6 is composed of a, or made from a pure monomer, uh, caprolactam. Um, nylons are almost exclusively melt spun, which means the material arrives as chips of the solid plastic material 
which is then melted down, forced through um, a uh, line under pressure to the spinneret, and then dried uh, or cooled in a, with cold air instead of warm air as in the dry spinning process. And the, um, the cool air hardens the uh, fibers as they come out of the uh, spinneret. Numerous uses, apparel, foundation garments, lingerie, hosiery, uh, jacket shells, carpeting, um, draperies, upholstery, tents, things like that. Olefins. Olefins were first produced by Hercules Company, 1958, and it's either one of two types of materials, either polyethylene or polypropylene, and they're used for completely different purposes. Um, they're developed directly from ethylene or propylene gases, which are derived from petroleum, and uh, they're also melt spun and are used in quite a few different things. Uh, interior fabrics and, and upholstery in automobiles as well as some home applications, carpeting occasionally, and uh, also ropes and cordage and packaging. Polyesters were first developed in 1953 by DuPont, and it has to be, polyester has to be at least 85% by weight of an ester of a substituted carboxylic acid, including not, but not limited to, substituted terphthalic acid units and para-substituted hydroxybenzoate units. Kind of a long-winded explanation, but the FTC gets pretty picky about things like that. Um, most of the polyester that's produced is polyethylene terphthalate, and it's everywhere. Anybody who's done any trace work with fibers, you see it all the time. Uh, it's just lint or junk fibers. Uh, it goes everywhere. Uh, it's used in all types of clothing, home furnishings, carpeting, drapering, draperies, sheets, upholstery, fiber fills and insulation, um, auto upholstery, ropes and cordage, thread, tire cord, and belts. Next is spandex. It was produced in 59 by DuPont, and it is composed of polyurethane. It's one of the wild uh, new directions that they went in in the late 50s. Uh, it's extruded as a monofilament or numerous fine filaments, which, are, which then coalesce after they're spun into a single monofilament, and it's used for anything where you need support or, or uh, elasticity such as um, athletic garments, foundation garments, surgical hosiery, things like that. And there are a few odd a few odd types of fibers which are not commonly encountered. Many of them are not even uh, manufactured anywhere in the world at this time. Um, Anadex, which is a condensation product of esters of monohydric alcohols and acrylic acid. It's not produced in the U.S. Aslan, this is an interesting one. This is composed of regenerated naturally occurring protein and uh, it's usually either casein, so it's derived from milk products, or alginate, which is from seaweed products, or other things like nut, um, nut, nut meats or nut shells. Um, that are ground up and the proteins are extracted and then made into fibers. And they um, happen to have IR spectra that are very similar to uh, wool and silk, as you might expect. Uh, metallic fibers, generally not produced, uh, at least not in the US at this time. Uh, nitrile, composed of greater than or at least 85% of vinylidine dinitrile. Um, they have not been commercially prepared in this country at least. Uh, PBI, as I mentioned earlier, polybenzamidazole, was produced by Selenese, or at least invented by them. Um, they're composed of aromatic polymer chains uh, with recurrent imidazole groups in the polymer but uh, they're not very commercially widespread or useful. Saran, you see these once in a while, but generally not too often. Originally uh, 
produced in 1941 by Firestone Plastics Company, and it's composed of has to be composed of at least 80 percent of vinylidine chloride units. It's more important as industrially and commercially as a film than as a fiber, but once in a while you do see it. Uh, sulfar, 1983, one of the last fiber types that's generally recognized. Uh, poly uh, polyphenylene sulfide. Uh, it has to have at least 85% of the polymer sulfide linkages attached directly to an aromatic ring. Um, again, not a really not a common fiber at all. Uh, we'd, I've never seen any of these. I don't think in casework. Uh, the last two are vinyl and vignon. Uh, vinyl is not produced in the United States. It has to be at least uh, 50 percent uh, uh, po composed of polyvinyl alcohol subunits. And uh, it has some strange properties, uh, especially in when, it's been, when it's been heated. Um, and vignon, composed of at least 85 percent vinyl chloride units, basically is polyvinyl chloride. Um, and again, not, uh, not very common, commonly found. Okay, now that I'm done with that, we'll get on to um, examination of fibers and identification. Okay, let's see where our slides. Okay, this is a photograph of a tape lift. So once you've identified which fiber you're looking for and you recovered it off your tape lift, here, this red ring is uh, a pen circle, a circle that the individual uh, drew around the, the tape lift in order to locate that fiber again later on. It's one technique from uh, for recovering things from tape lifts. Once, uh, we also have a photograph of a stereo microscope. This is where you do a lot of your initial work uh, you want to evaluate what you've got and try to determine what you're going to be looking for in your tape lifts or wherever your question uh, fiber source is, is coming from. <clears throat> you want to get a good idea of what you're looking for beforehand uh, so you don't wade through a bunch of uh, meaningless stuff. So it's a good idea to take a quick look at your uh, standards first before you start messing with your tape lifts. And at this point, you can use lots of uh, different lighting techniques to uh, examine your fibers, or your question fibers and your standards to see if there's any uh, common properties between them. Uh, different types of light, room light, daylight, if you can arrange it, um, your, your illuminator that comes with your scope, and then even laser or uh, UV light or an alternate light source like a poly light can be useful sometimes. After you're done with your low power work, then you can go on to a compound scope, the PLM scope, and evaluate some of the optical and physical properties of your fiber. One of the major ones is birefringence. And birefringence is estimated by measuring or determining the approximate diameter or thickness of the fiber and then with cross polars you examine the fiber and determine what order of birefringence you're seeing, interference colors you're seeing in the fiber um, and then you can relate that to the retardation caused by the material in the fiber using a Michael Levy chart. I didn't bring one along but I hope some of you at least have seen it. I know some of you have seen it. Uh, this is a slide of some acrylic fibers. Uh, they have some interesting surface texture, kind of irregular. Uh, that's usually purposefully put into the fiber. They want it to appear to be, uh, or at least to simulate some kind of a natural fiber. When you cross the polars with an acrylic fiber, Basically, you get just a washed out grayish white color. That's because if you look at the handout, that, that page, 
Acrylic is one of the fibers with low birefringence. So what happens with low birefringence fibers is you see anything from a dark gray to a, a, almost a white color without any other, t other colors in the fiber itself. As you go on to a medium birefringence fiber, I think is the next group, should be um, something akin to an olefin. You get pale colors and you should get some compensation when you put the the uh, red plate in. The red plate is, a con is a called a compensator or a full wave plate, various other names for it. And uh, it's used to determine the sign of elongation of a fiber if it's a low birefringent fiber. And it's also used to determine with moderate birefringent fibers, you can determine what order of colors you're seeing. For example, when you cross the polars. You see this rather pinkish color. Can't really tell from that if that, that looks like it may be first order red. So that if you know what the, what the color you are seeing is, what order of retardation you're seeing uh, due to the birefringence of the fiber, you can measure, if you have an ocular micrometer, you can measure the approximate thickness or diameter of the fiber and then you can go to the Michael Levy chart and find out what your birefringence is um, as far as a numerical value is concerned and you can get an idea of what this fiber might be. This one I think happens to be nylon. Now if you'll notice the color changes when you add when you add this uh, full wave plate into, into the um, optical system when the fibers are oriented such that the slow rays and the fibers or the high birefring birefringence direction of the fiber is, is parallel to that of the compensator, then you get addition of retardation so that the color you see in the fiber at the center will get paler with a positive uh, sign of elongation, which all medium and higher birefringence fibers will have. There are no negative elongation fibers with high birefringence. Uh, if you turn the stage and orient the fibers at 90 degrees to the way they are in this photograph, you'll see the colors get more intense rather than paler as you insert the compensator. And that's the subtractive direction. It's now subtracting. Um, the uh, uh, retardation from that observed in the fiber. And if it's only first order, <clears throat> the center of the fiber where it's pink here should go black instead of paler pink with the fiber oriented the other way. That's if you've got your scope set up right. And this I think is a polyester fiber. Something I didn't mention, I mentioned it but didn't give an example. These little speckles that you see, some of these little particles in these fibers, that's the delustrant. These are delustered fibers. And they typically will mix something, usually titanium dioxide, but they may use a few other things, in with the fiber to alter its appearance if they don't want it to be particularly shiny, uh, make it more look, like, look more like a natural fiber. Okay, characteristic of polyesters is you see multiple bands of color because these fibers are so birefringent that you see within a single fiber you can see multiple orders of retardation colors and each order successfully is paler than the last one so when you get to the to the center of the fiber the colors are so washed out that um, they almost fade to to a whitish greenish yellow color they're almost useless. Uh, if you use a quartz wedge, you can bring that, uh, the colors back to first order again by inserting the quartz wedge with the fibers oriented the other direction, subtract the birefringence, the retardation rather, um, that the fibers are producing, and uh, you can determine 
uh, how birefringent the fibers are, but if you see something that looks like this with cross polars, you're almost sure it's going to be a polyester. Okay, that's all the, f I think that's all the fibers. Yeah. Okay, that's cross sections. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, as I said before, sign of elongation is important with low birefringence fibers because there are some fibers that are have negative sign of elongation. Sign of elongation is defined by whether the refractive index in the direction parallel to the length of the fiber is higher or lower than the refractive index in the direction across the fiber. If the refractive index parallel to the fiber is, um, I forgot to check, I forgot to, to uh, modify my uh, handout here. Anyway, if uh, if the fiber, if you put in a low birefringence fiber between cross polars and you align the fiber so that it is parallel to the, the length of the fiber is parallel to the um, slow ray of the compensator, if the sign of the elongation is positive, then the fiber will appear blue. And that will be the case for acetates, aslon, things like that. If the fiber is um, oriented in that direction and the fiber has a negative sign of elongation, then when you insert the um, compensator, it will appear orange. If it looks anything different than that, then you don't have a, you made a mistake and you don't have a low birefringence fiber. Uh, as I said before, medium and high birefringence fibers are all positive elongation. Um, the next property listed here is extinction. When you put fibers between cross polars and you rotate the stage, when they line up with the polarizer and the analyzer at right angles, you'll see the fibers disappear. Uh, and a notable exception to that is not uh, a synthetic fiber, but it's diagnostic for cotton. Cotton never goes completely to extinction. Uh, pleochroism is another property. It's also important in minerals. Uh, when you put it in between, not between cross polars, but when you look at a fiber in, in polarized light, it, if it has different colors, depending on the direction, either parallel or perpendicular to the um, polarizer's pass direction, uh, then it's showing uh, the property called pleochroism, and that can be diagnostic. It can help you include or exclude a fiber as being similar to uh, your standard. Diameter, you usually use an ocular micrometer to estimate what your diameter is, and this helps you with your birefringence measurements. Presence or absence of delustrants is also used uh, quite often. If it's present, you want to gauge the extent of the delustrant present and uh, the appearance of the delustrant. This is also characteristic for, for comparing fibers. How do you measure the amount? Well, it's just a subjective, basically, but you can gauge whether there's a lot of it or uh, a very little of it. Some fibers, like fibers are generally classified as bright or semi-dull or dull or delustered. And so general will fit into one of those categories. There's really no way of quantitating um, the amount of delustrant per se. Does it ever pay to determine what the delustrant is, like titanium versus ferrum sulfate or zinc oxide or whatever? If you had, it would, yes, if you had the ability to do that. Some laboratories, I'm sure, don't have the necessary instrumentation or the techniques to, to do that. But yes, if you found two different delustrants, that would uh, necessarily uh, cause you to exclude that fiber. Okay, surface and internal characteristics. Uh, some fibers have distinctive surface characteristics like that uh, acrylic fiber that we saw. It has um, flat spots on it or rough edges or whatever. Um, some, of, Many of those are purposefully put in there. Uh, some fibers contain um, other inclusions like air bubbles. I've seen those a few times. There are also fibers that are um, are hollow, have a, an air 
space running down the middle of the fiber, and that can be also diagnostic. Okay, uh, fluorescence microscopy, another property of the fibers, some of them fluoresce, some of them don't. Uh, if you have the proper equipment, um, putting them uh, on the fluorescence scope and taking a look at them with different wavelengths of light as excitation energy, looking for fluorescence uh, is also a new, an, uh, another way of uh, determining the possible shared existence or origin of two uh, fibers. Why do some fibers fluoresce and others don't? Some fibers are produced with optical brighteners within the fiber themselves. Now, there are a lot of detergents that are laundry products that have optical brighteners in them as well. But uh, many synthetic fibers are made with an optical brightener uh, as part of the polymer. It's already included. And some, sometimes they're used as a tag by the manufacturer if they... Uh, to help them identify their own fiber. Uh, Cross-sectioning. Get to go to the new slide. How'd that get on? So out of focus. That's close. There are many different cross sections that are produced in synthetic fibers. Many of them are round. Some of them are almost round, but they're uh, like some of those acrylics. They have flat spots, uh, and those are sometimes done on purpose. Sometimes they're just cheaply manufactured fibers, depending on what their intended uh, ultimate use is, and uh, they end up being not quite round just because of slop in the system during the manufacture of the fiber. Uh, some of them are trilobal. These are typical, typically seen as carpet fibers, but they also, trilobal fibers appear in lots of other applications as well. Uh, dog bone basically looks like a little barbell on the end. Um, those are typical acrylics. A lot of acrylics are dog bone or bean shaped as uh, the one just below dog bone. Looks like a kidney bean in cross-section. There are multi-lobed or serrated fibers. Uh, if it has many, many striations, that's characteristic for viscose rayon. It, it uh, has a lot of little tiny lobes because the fiber shrinks as it goes into the coagulating bath and it draws in upon itself and sort of um, crinkles up on the surface, and that causes that, uh, that appearance. Then there are a lot of irregular type fibers. Uh, they can be anything, any cross-section you can imagine uh, can uh, be out there as, as far as irregulars, because there is no control over the uh, actual cross-section of the fibers. Where would we see the irregular shapes? Is it mostly like in uh, automobile carpeting, or would we find this in the home, or shirts, or what? Uh, boy, you got me kind of at the <laughs> at a loss right there. Um, a lot of there's a lot of junk fibers that are just made for uh, general purpose. Like a lot of polyesters are made for insulation, just you know quilted. Um, I don't know if anybody else here knows anything about where they might find them specifically. Uh, you do see them, uh, and they really look wild. They look like almost like popcorn, some of those cross sections. They're just completely randomly uh, shaped. N you never find, you look at a whole bunch of them cross-sectioned in a bundle, you can go through and look at each individual one, and none, no two are alike. They're like snowflakes. So I don't know what they do to it after they spin it to make it do that. It may, it may be variations in pressure going through the spinneret. Uh, I'm really not sure, but I do know when you, you see them, some of them are really interesting. Most of them with the irregular shapes have, are made that way for texturizing purposes, to make them curly or to make them fuller than they ordinarily would be. Yeah, they won't lie next to each other as easily. 
Um, then you have some irregular, I mean, uh, some oddball shape ones that are, there's, they're not irregular, but there's no seeming, seemingly no rhyme or reason to them. They just uh, are that way. Some of them, like the propeller-shaped one, that was done by Monsanto for a while to get around DuPont's patent on the uh, trilobal configuration for carpet fibers. As soon as DuPont's patent ran out, then they stopped doing that basically except for once in a while they would come up with a fiber that they wanted to have a special cross section and they went back to it and you still see them once in a while but uh, the original version of the propeller shaped fiber was produced just to get around uh, uh, DuPont's patent. Uh, there are lots of different methods Probably every person you talk to has their own method for cross-sectioning. Here's a photograph of a almost triangular but trilobal fiber. You'll also notice in this cross-section that the dye is not throughout the fiber. Dye is more concentrated at the periphery and uh, has not diffused throughout the fiber. And this is typical. Carpet fibers typically are dyed after the carpet is made. They, uh, the mill will make the carpet. They'll get the, the weave pattern, texture pattern that uh, is intended. And then they will put that carpet in storage and wait for somebody to order that carpet in a particular color. Then they take it off the shelf from the storage room, take it in and dye it the color that was ordered. And it will be dyed as carpet intact instead of the yarns being dyed before the carpet is manufactured. It's much more economically feasible and less uh, of a burden on the inventory, having a lot of capital tied up in inventory that way. Um, one of the ways you can cross-section fibers is to embed them in a block of some kind of plastic or resin, something like Versamid or something uh, like that. Uh, that's technique that's been used by a lot of people. I don't happen to like that one myself too much. It's kind of a lot of trouble to go to for my, uh, for the benefit you get from it. Uh, there's a one called the Joliffe method which employs a plastic card with a bunch of small holes punched in it and the fibers are drawn in a bunch through the hole and then they're sectioned by hand usually with a razor blade. Uh, the Hardy Microtome, I happen to bring one with me. Carry it wherever I go. You never know when you might want to cross-section a fiber. Uh, the Hardy Microtome, it's about the size of a microscope slide, comes in two halves. It has a little slot that the fiber bundle goes into. You usually put your question fiber in with a tuft of other fibers that you know about, you know their origin, so you'll recognize them again. Then they go into that slot, and then there's a little plunger on the top, which is operated by a screw which pushes them by incremental uh, distances through the slot where you can uh, apply some sort of adhesive to the tuft of little these fibers sticking through the slot and uh, cut them off with a razor blade and then you can make the mounts onto a transfer that to a slide and mount them to look at your cross sections. Uh, I'll have it up here later on if any of you are not familiar with that particular instrument. Uh, and I'll show you how it works. Uh, the next method is to, you can thread a fiber into the end of an Eppendorf type pipette tip, if you can steal them from your serology section. Uh, you thread the fiber in the small end so you get it up in there a ways. If it's a really kinked or crimped fiber, this is hard to do. Both it's hard to get it in there and it's hard to section it once you get it in there then it may be a better method for those. But if the fiber is relatively straight, you can do this fairly easily. Once you get it in there, you tip the tip up on end and you put a drop of Norland optical adhesive in there. And you let it run down till it gets down to the tip and it won't force the fiber out. The fiber will stay in there from static uh, electricity. Static charges will hold it in place. Once it gets down there, you nuke it under the UV lamp. That sets up the adhesive and then you go under your stereoscope and you hack away. You try to get as thin as possible. 
It takes a little practice. All these methods take a little bit of practice. There's none of them, except maybe the, if you can successfully embed your fibers in a block and you have a good microtome, like a sliding sledge type microtome, you might be able to get fairly easily get uh, good sections that way. But um, if you don't have that equipment, you don't have that equipment. And the last one was one that was taught to the class, uh, those who took the uh, last trace uh, class from McCrone up at LAPD. Uh, Skip Palinick showed us a technique where you put a fiber between small squares of 10 mil polyethylene sheet, and then you press it between microscope slides on a hot plate until the polyethylene softens, and then you press it together and take it off and hold it until the, until the polyethylene hardens again. Then you have a nice three-quarter inch or so square of polyethylene to hang on to, and then you can take your uh, razor blade or scalpel and section it that way, and that works pretty well too. We just need to get a hold of some of that uh, polyethylene film in this laboratory. Um, okay, you're going to examine your cut sections. I think. Getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back. Uh, one of your sheets in your handout shows a whole bunch of cross sections of fibers and describes modification ratio. That's why we section fibers. We want to see what, what their cross sectional shape is and determine possibly the modification ratio. Modification ratio is simply the ratio of the diameters or the radii, whatever, of a circle that you um, circumscribe around the perimeter of the fiber and the smallest circle that you can inscribe within the perimeter of the fiber. So you have one bigger circle going around the three lobes and an inner circle which touches the inside of the three smallest portions of the fiber, and that ratio is your modification ratio. This fiber would have a very small modification ratio. <clears throat> a round fiber wouldn't have one, but you can do this with almost any kind of fibers, even some of those tetralobal square ones, it works. It's kind of tedious. You, have to take a, you usually have to take a photograph, unless you've got some means of projecting it on the wall, uh, but you take a photograph and uh, a template and determine the diameters of your circles and get your modification ratio pretty quickly that way. Okay, next we'll talk about infrared. It's a photograph of our infrared microscope and spectrophotometer. Uh, this allows you to take infrared spectra of prepared fiber samples and that will tell you, you know, you can get all your all your guesses and you think it is this and this from your uh, micro microscopy but until you actually get some sort of confirmatory test like infrared uh, you don't know. This is a picture of a piece of a fiber. These are one millimeter apart and this fiber was pressed. I'm not sure exactly how. That was uh, Rich's method, Rich Brown's method from uh, about 1985 or so where you take a fiber and melt, warm it yeah. uh, between two slides and then after you started to see the fiber just get a little bit um, warm, um, you then press it very, very quickly and hard and it would flatten out. The distance you see there is uh, um, less than a millimeter. So you're, you're talking about a fairly small fiber that you can work with and, and still you know, produce some fairly good results. And by thinning it that way, then you don't have the concentrated uh, spectrum. OK, and then you mount the fiber on some sort of a pinhole. It's hard to see the fiber kind of lying there on the pinhole. You can also do this by flattening the fiber. And there's a lot of ways you can flatten it. Uh, we've used uh, a KBR pellet press to squash them with. 
Uh, SpectraTech has a doodad that they have. We just got our two of them that we asked for some time ago. Um, it has a little roller, like a little steamroller thing on one end and an exacto knife on the other end. And uh, I haven't tried it yet. It's supposed to be pretty slick. <clears throat> you roll the fiber out and then you can put it on a KBR window and uh, do it that way. Okay, then after you've got your identification, you want to do some comparison microscopy where you put your question and your known right next to each other and uh, examine them carefully, compare them for all the, all the uh, properties that you observed them when you looked at them separately. The order that you do all these things could be different. You could do comparison microscopy before you did any, any spectroscopy on it. I, I usually would do that, actually. And then photomicrography, you have a setup like this. You can take photographs of your fibers. You can show them next to each other to photograph them, cross the polars, show that they have the same or similar birefringence colors, uh, photograph that and uh, can make a good display for court. I think that's the last slide. Russ, have you had much luck with where you do colors that way? Do colors show up pretty close to... It depends. Yeah, you have to be careful. Sometimes if you have two different scopes with two different illuminators, you can get problems with color balance. Um, if you have, we have a scope that we inherited from Santa Ana's lab that has a split fiber optic, so you theoretically get half the light of the uh, illuminator to each of the scopes. And that works a lot better. You got, instead of having two independent light sources, and uh, your colors come out pretty well. And I've gotten some pretty good photographs. It's not always real easy because you've got to get the orientations of the fibers right, and it's not going to look the same in one corner of the photograph as in another. But uh, it works pretty well. Um, solubility. It's not used too much these days unless you don't have any other means of identifying your fibers. It's also not as selective uh, as uh, IR uh, is because uh, some fibers tend to react to the solvents in similar ways. But uh, it's, there's lots of schemes. I've put three, I think, in the handout. And they're fun to play with. But uh, as I said, IR is better because you can get the fiber back afterwards and you only use a little, little portion of it, uh, whereas you might use quite a bit of fiber doing solubility testing on, uh, on your uh, question sample. You also want to run your questioned and known in parallel when you're doing solubility to make sure that they dissolve um, at the same, with this, in the same amount of time and in the same way because different fibers dissolve uh, in different ways with different solvents. So you want to make sure your behavior is the same in both cases. And last thing on here is melting point. It's also destructive, but it can also help you identify, especially if you don't have IR, it can help you identify or at least corroborate some of your other observations to allow you to conclude what uh, generic clash your fiber is made of. Uh, generally, well, there's two different schools of thought and one that I have, a uh, reference I have where they do it both ways. Some people mount it in just air, dry mount, cover it with a cover slip and put it on the hot stage and heat it up and watch it melt and then they go back and do it again mounted in silicone oil or something like that. Um, I like the silicone oil technique because I'm more confident that it's an even heating process that you're not going to get a hot spot in one place that's going to affect your result. Uh, if you have a pole scope and you can do this with a pole scope, it makes it really easy because you just watch for the birefringence of your fiber to disappear when your fiber goes uh, to extinction, then you know that it basically has melted. It's lost all of its crystallinity that was uh, imparted to it when it was drawn and, and uh, spun. Uh, if you don't have uh, pull, a pole scope with your hot stage, 
then you have to do what we do. We use the same scope we use for our glass examinations. It's a face uh, contrast scope and uh, just watch for it to soften and lose its shape and then sort of diffuse into the mounting medium. And I think that's all I have to talk about. Carbon get on. Oh, right. I skipped over that when I was... Um, yes, the last uh, fiber proficiency sample we got included an anti-static fiber that was in there, and I got hold of... Uh, this part of your handout has a list of... There are a whole bunch of different anti-static fibers that are produced, especially in, uh, in carpet fibers. of all different cross-sections and all different um, formulations of uh, the materials that are in them. And they're basically intended just to um, disperse static charges from people walking across the carpet. However, they're not very prevalent in most of the carpet uh, samples. When I heard that there was and it's supposed to be an anti-static fiber in this sample. I went back, took our proficiency samples out again, and went through them. And it took me about 20 minutes to find it. So it's not something that jumps right out at you. But you will see a fiber in there that's slightly darker, usually looks slightly darker than the rest of the fibers. And uh, the, the one I think that was in this one was a completely different cross-section as well. But unless you know it's there, or unless you're assuming it's there, uh, it might not occur to you to look for it. Anybody have any questions? It's not. Okay. Um, they dye something very dark or very black. They use as many dyes as they can just to make it as opaque as they can, so it's a good TLC sample. Uh, this watch cap had both a purple uh, fiber and kind of a grayish blue fiber. Uh, under reflected light, they both looked black, but under transmitted light, they had slightly different colors. Um, but I couldn't find both samples. I only found one sample. So instead, I gave Jeff some of the purple fibers that I had kept, and also in our fabric sample, I had what's called a jersey, acrylic fiber with blue and black and gray print and uh, to look at as a second sample. So I looked at that with the microspectrophotometer and uh, Jeff looked at the dyes with thin layer chromatography that he's going to talk about later. Okay, let's see. Focus. That way? No, that way. No? There we go. More or less in focus. That's the Michelle Levy chart that uh, Russell was talking about. This is the microspectra photometer. It's not much more than a microscope with a big box on it. I'll explain some of these parts in a few minutes. The rest of this down here is pretty much of an ordinary microscope. This is set up for transmitted light. Let's see. This is the transmitted illuminator here. The light comes in through the bottom. There's what are called field stops down below. It doesn't have your ordinary condenser with the field diaphragm and the substage diaphragm because when you're making measurements, you want everything to be exactly the same. And so these field diaphragms and substage diaphragms, if they weren't in exactly the same position, could ca cause some difference in your readings. All this does, this microscope is set up to measure the UV invisible light that's given off by your particle, your fiber, whatever. And it will then print out your standard UV visible curve. And so it's a very sensitive method for measuring color. And at least theoretically, it can go down as small as three quarters of a micron or a micrometer. 
Um, so let's see, what the, all the parts. Uh, there's a field stops down here. This is what you use instead of your field diaphragm. That has small little holes, but they stay consistent with the little pinhole, so we can put sizes in there. This is the condenser, and it uses a uh, ordinary objective. This is 10x objective here for you. Now? Uh, let's see. I have, this has a rotating stage like you find on polarizing microscopes because I wanted to see the difference in pleochroism. Russell talked about the different colors that you can get under uh, polarized light with a single polar. And uh, in order to measure the pleochroism, I got a rotating stage. Mm, let's see, and what's it got up above there? This is uh, changes the direction of the light in one position that'll allow it to go through the eyepieces. Another position will allow it to go straight up through. Um, there's a camera port here, and in another position will go up through the camera. This is the reflected light illuminator, and then that's a mercury light for the fluorescence light. Do you actually get uh, fluorescence? Um, Spectra? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, it's a little bit difficult. Um, let's see, how can, I, how can I explain this? In order to make a measurement, you have to uh, produce a standard curve. You have to adjust the photometer. This is the photometer that's actually doing the measurement up there. And uh, you have to tell it how dark, the maximum dark and maximum light it's going to be. So it can it adjust its sensitivity. And right here it's got different filters to uh, adjust that. When you uh, do a comparison, you make a spectra, you're measuring the light that's given off by your particle, but you're comparing it to a standard white curve, which is your maximum brightness. For transmitted light, all you do is you look at your microscope slide and your mounting media, so the light's going through the slide, through your mounting media and cover slip, but without going through your particle, and that's your standard white curve. For reflected light, I've got another slide that I'll show you how I do a reflected white curve. Fluorescence is even more difficult because what you're looking at is not reflected light, not transmitted light, but emitted light from the particle itself after a radiation by the UV light. And you have to make what's called a theoretical curve uh, by cranking up the light on your transmitted light all the way as, as high as it can go and then saying, okay, that's as bright as it's gonna go, as dark as it's gonna go, create a theoretical curve because the light of your emission is always going to be less than the light of your excitation. And it gets uh, pretty complicated. But yes, you can measure the spectra of the emitted fluorescent light. That's the purpose of it. Up here, there's um, your measuring spot. That can be in various sizes. And we'll see what that looks like under the microscope a little bit later. This is your monochrometer that changes the wavelength of light as it makes its measurements. And I mentioned the filter box and the photometer up there. Oh, and um, this is the computer software part of it. We have two monitors. This is a black and white or monochrome text monitor and a uh, color graphics monitor. The reason for having two of them is sometimes you want to see the text and the graphics at the same time and you'd have to be very difficult to switch them back and forth. Uh, this was long before they developed windows. In fact, this is a 286 with a uh, math coprocessor in it. So they probably have much more advanced systems now. 
Do you have any chance you could take the hard drive that's in that and put it in a 3 or 486? Oh, sure. There is the only problem with the, just getting the compatibility of the software that Zeiss has for, to run their microspectral photometer because all the shutters and everything are run by this um, central processing unit down there. And that controls the shutters, it controls the speed that the monochromator is going, it controls uh, the sensitivity of the photometer, and uh, then integrates it with the software to produce the spectra. Did it, uh, did it come with a polarizer in, in the light pad, or is that something you just like snuck in because you said you added the rotating stage? Well, you can get, this is built on a Zeiss Universal microscope, and Universal means universal. You can put any kind of accessories you want on it. I am very much of a, of a fan of polarized light, and so I wanted polarizing accessories. And yes, we do have uh, a polarizing filter that can go down here, or we can put a regular Abbey condenser on in this stage here. And then there, you can't see it very well, but there's a slot in here for the compensator and the analyzer. So you can do a whole range of polarizing uh, microscopy on it. Okay, we also have two printers. This is a HP plotter that I like because it's like a robot arm. Makes all the, the fancy graphs. And then we also have a text printer, a dot matrix Epson printer. Uh, to print out numerical data when we do our colorimetry. Okay, this shows the menu for the system when we first get it. Uh, the setup, we don't have to worry about that setup when you first install the instrument and then you don't have to do it anymore. It tells which cables are going to which thing so the central processing unit can do all the adjustments. The adjust you do when you first turn on the instrument, that's what I was telling, it measures the maximum darkness, they call it the adjusted dark current. And basically what it does, it shuts off all the lights, all the filters, and measures what light is leaking, like through the eyepieces um, that might interfere with your readings. That's the maximum darkness. And then measure M3, is you measure first your standard curve, that's an S. Um, then you measure your object O, and the graph or the printout you usually get is a Q, a quotient, uh, the object divided by the, the standard. It's like subtracting the background data in an IR if you're familiar with that. There, uh, you can get a printout of the wavelength and the line scans in the spectra after you've measured it. This is uh, data memory processing. You can get a directory of your files, recalling your data, saving data, and the path is, is where on your hard disk or uh, floppy disk you're saving it. And the evaluation, it can plot. That's when it's making the graph at the uh, on the plotter. You can make a quotient between any object curve and the standard and do a mean. Most fibers, one of the problems with measuring the dyes on fibers is that not all fibers take up the dyes the same way. Some fibers will dye a little bit darker than others depending upon what uh, side arms they have on it. And so it's usually best to do a mean or an average. And this will average several quotient spectra all together to give you a mean or average spectra. So you can either measure uh, one fiber in very many different places, or if you have a tuft of fibers, you can measure several different fibers, average those all out together. And it makes a little it makes the curve smoother, it smooths out any noise that might be there, and it also gives you a bit, little bit better curve for comparison. List will simply list out for each wavelength that will tell you the reading that the photometer made if you want to do any
kind of calculations or you want to see where the peak of a particular uh, curve is, you can do that. Let's see, the arithmetics are uh, various manipulations to smooth curves, to add curves, subtract curves, and this is, you have to go into this menu to do your theoretical curve for the fluorescence uh, standard curve. E6 is colorimetry. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. But colorimetry basically is the scientific measurement of getting a numerical value for a color. And search, it's, uh, it's has like a little library uh, that you can search. I'll show you two spectrums of two different blue dyes and how they differ. And you can if you have a color, say on a blue dye or a blue paint, you can search through this library and it'll give you the best match. Though it's a little bit limited though, yeah, I think it, what is it, 180 or something like that spectra is the maximum it can be in one library search just because of the limitation of the library. But you can, you can overcome that by saying, well, this is all blue paint, this is all red paint, or this is all yellow paint, and it'll search just that one little section. Uh, down below the header just puts on a, a, uh, a headline or, or uh, a column up above your plot if you want to. And the rest of this looks like you can do basic commands, but basically when you use this command B to go to basic command, it quits this software goes back to your DOS so and you, you can do your basic commands, but then you have to go back and readjust, remeasure everything. So it's really not that helpful to go to basic commands. Okay, here I'm measuring the, the standard curve. You can save it by putting in the file number, the voltage for the lamp, the bandwidth is um, the tolerance of the wavelength that's measuring. Like if you're measuring 470 nanometers, it'll measure, if you put in half a nanometer bandwidth, it'll measure it between 469.5 and 470.5, something like that. The tolerance for how accurate the wavelength is. Field stop, that's the little spot down below the pinhole that's the substitute for the field diaphragm. Measuring diaphragm um, is up above, and that's the spot it's actually measuring. The condenser um, magnification, the objective magnification. The measurement mode, I typed in here whether it's transmitted, reflected, fluorescence. And here it has a stain I suppose for biological stains, you put whether it's hematoxylin or eosin or something like that. I use this field to put in the receipt number. You could put in a file number or something to relate it to your particular case. Um, also, there's a limitation. Of the 180 spectra is all, if you had a uh, subdirectory on your hard drive, It'll only put 180 files in there. It won't, even though your hard drive has a lot more memory, it'll say the memory is full. And I found it useful to, for each case to have a subdirectory for this receipt number and put everything for each case on one uh, subdirectory. The date and then the operator that ran it. The adjusted dark current, the ADC is what they're talking about here. The wavelength it's measuring is here, the intensity, and the gain is the attenuation most people are familiar with. This is on the graphics monitor, the kind of picture that you get. This is a blood stain curve and absorbance showing the peaks and valleys at the various wavelengths down here. Um, it's usually run between 380 nanometers and 770 nanometers. I think it can actually go down from 250 to 800 nanometers. The reason for this 
this is the standardized visible spectra. And when we get into the scientific measurement of color, the colorimetry, in what was it, 1934, they made the standard, well, all our measurements are going to be from 380 to 770. So in order to do those calculations, it has to be between these two numbers that the software says, you know, your data is out of range or something like that. All right, these are some of the things that you can do, forensic examinations with the uh, microspectrophotometer. In transmittance mode or absorbance, you can look at the dyes in fibers, coloring and dye analysis. You can look at fibers and coatings, if there's any uh, special coatings, what do they call that, optical coatings on the fibers. Uh, you can make measurements of those. Uh, theoretically, you could make measurements of the uh, delustrants that Russell was talking about. But that would have to be in reflected mode. Uh, specular reflectance is the light going through the objective and bouncing down 180 degrees, bouncing up 180 degrees from, from what you're illuminating. We don't use that very often. Apparently in Germany they've found some uses in camouflage paint identification. Most of what we use in reflectance is diffuse reflectance looking at the light coming in from 45 degrees and then bouncing up. Um, in the chromaticity calculations, uh, that's what it's, the standard degree reflection is, 45 degrees. And then there's also fluorescence. They say security paint coating. Some have uh, ultraviolet uh, markings and things like dry cleaner marks or something like that. Uh, it, there are also some paints that fluoresce. I haven't been too successful yet, but I'm working on trying to look at the optical brighteners from laundries that Russell mentioned from different detergents and things on fibers. I just haven't found the right filters and conditions on the fluorescence to use yet. But uh, potentially, um, that's possible to do. We don't use the densitometry mode much. I think that might work for TLC or something on that Yeah. In the reflectance mode, you'd have to use reflected light, and then you could use the densitometry mode to measure the how bright the light is that's being reflected off. So you might get some at least semi-quantitative values out of that. This is the chromaticity diagram that in 1934 they came up with. This is, they used a bunch of observers to observe color. The wavelength is around the outside here and they developed these X and Y coordinates to pinpoint the various shades of light. So your numerical value is the intersection of the coordinates of X and Y. These are called the chromaticity coordinates. There's one disadvantage of this uh, perception of color, and that is, for instance, the difference between various shades of, of green. This is green, believe it or not. The blue is down here. The various shades of green are a lot farther apart than say the shades of red. And so if you're making a color comparison, get one to get a number of how close these colors are, then they developed a uh, new standard in the 1960s called the CIE Lab Color Space. And they transformed these XY chromaticity coordinates into A, actually A star, B star and L star coordinates. The A star goes from red to green, the B star goes from blue to yellow, and the L star uh, goes from black to white. So this would be your saturation colors, and this would be your hue colors, and how far along this coordinate goes would be your chroma. 
if anybody is familiar with the Munsell um, nomenclature. Now, in order to compare the colors, this is the formula that they use. Delta E is the square root of the sums of the squares of your three coordinates. In uh, comparing particularly fibers or um, anything that's going to have a variance in color, the um, International Commission of, on Color, which is what CIE stands for, and you'd hate my French, so I'm not going to pronounce it, use um, transmitted light and the uh, chromaticity coordinates in transmitted light come up into a box like this uh, of a single source of fibers. But if you measure it in absorbance, it comes up into a much smaller box. And so the Germans from Zeiss who developed the software uh, developed what's called complementary chromaticity coordinates. And these are actually much more precise in comparing colors than the chromaticity coordinates in transmittance. This shows the text monitor uh, evaluating the CIE lab colors. The, this, these are the chromaticity coordinates, X, Y, Z. This is a different system. Uh, the L star, A star, and B star values for the CIE lab values. Each one of these, A, C, D65, and E, are under different uh, sources of illumination. A is the tungsten light. C is what they thought daylight color was in 1934, but then they found out there actually was a lot more ultraviolet radiation in daylight, so in 1965 they changed it to D65. And E would be the color it would appear under fluorescent lights. Um, if you looked at any dyed fabrics under tungsten light, daylight, or fluorescent light, it actually shows slightly different color you can measure. Um, the DL is the difference between your standard and your unknown, and then it comes up with the DE, which is the, as we said, the comparison between the standard and the unknown. Generally, depending upon the, the wavelength of light, your eye can discriminate between a uh, delta E star of between 3 and 10. So anything less than 10, I say, for all intents and purposes, is the same color. If it's more than 10, it shows some obvious differences. Are yes. They were probably two different, I mean, two different fibers from the same source. You can also get all this printed out, which I do for court purposes, uh, in a hard copy. So the DE prints out down there at the bottom. Okay, now I was showing you the various setups. This is the transmitted light application. The fore there's a little uh, fluorescent set that goes in this corner here for fluorescent light that has a partially silvered mirror. This is the setup for reflectance. It's built so it's 45 degree illumination. The illumination comes down this one and then goes up that one. And because you don't want any spurious reflections, um, the condenser is lowered all the way and that objective is taken out just so there's nothing reflecting off the bottom. And here you can see a little bit better, this is the uh, holder for the analyzer. You can't see it here, but there's a little slot there for the complex. 
this is the filter set for the fluorescence light, band pass, uh, fluorescent through pass, long pass light. This is for ultraviolet light. And it's uh, the excitation is at 365 nanometers. Uh, anything more than 397 nanometers pass through the filter can be measured. This shows um, the reflected light unit, and this is how I make a uh, white, standard white curve. Um, the person that set it up usually uses a white business card, but that's for uh, informal purposes. For formal purposes, uh, they have this little ring. You make a powdered barium sulfate white standard. Just make a very smooth white surface to measure your maximum light being given off. Okay, this shows curve for two different dyes. I was talking about the search library. Uh, these are different car dyes. This is thalocyanin blue and this is iron blue. And you can see the curves are markedly different. Not only is there a shift in the wavelength of blues, but there's a little bit of red color right there in the thalocyanin blue. I, mount, I like to mount almost everything nowadays in normal optical adhesive. You could theoretically mount it at anything <coughs> that you wanted um, because you're subtracting your background. If you mounted it in, in Canada Balsam, for instance, that's kind of yellowish, you'd be subtracting that yellow when you do your quotient <coughs> curve. Um, when I'm doing paints, um, you measure that oftentimes with reflected light, and that you don't want it mounted at all uh, because the cover slip will uh, absorb some of the light that's being reflected onto the paint. But for the fibers, I'm using transmitted light, and it goes right through the mounting medium. Which one would you use? 61, I think. Except the 1.525? It, it, uncured, and then cured, it's 1.561. Okay. I think that shows, not a very good picture, that shows the dark purple fibers that I gave to uh, Jeff. This was from the bank robbery case that I was mentioning where the guy shot through the, through the cap. This shows uh, the size of the spot. The spot you can make in various sizes. In this particular case, I was wanting to measure the uh, dye and hair, and I didn't want the natural color of the hair to interfere, so I was measuring right on the scales, on the cuticle uh, margin. So I was using a very small spot or dot here, and that's all it's measuring, it's just that one little spot. And then with the pinhole, you use what's called redundant aperturing, you close down all the light except what you want to illuminate your uh, spot that you're measuring. This is a closer up picture of those pinholes. They come in different sizes. That's uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.16 millimeters. And blank, you know, no spot in there so you can have a good place to focus on your specimen. Okay, and this shows the spectrum that I got out for dyed hair. Uh, there's quite a bit of noise in this region, but it, at least it shows you the kind of curve that we obtain from this instrument. It's in intensity mode. Um, I was trying to think of of cases that I've had where I've used this. We've had a lot of good success with paint and a few uh, fiber cases, but not really too many. This particular case, a uh, little old lady was killed in her apartment 
and she had three different identical wigs. One she was wearing and two others, one that was on her dresser and another one that was in her closet. And there were some fibers on the suspect and just for court purposes to see if I could say which wig those fibers came from. They were manufactured to be identically the same. Um, this one right here, what I call JV9J, shows a lot of differences. Uh, these two could actually be the same. A small qualitative difference or quantitative difference between those two is not really too significant. This um, curve I made to show the difference in pleochroism, there's not all that much difference in the, in the spectra except here in this area. The uh, peaks are about the same, they're just in a different position. The red one is uh, parallel to the direction of polar polarization and the blue one is perpendicular. This uh, shows a uh, spectrum of the dark purple fibers and um, Jeff will show you that he got six different uh, dyes out of it. I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, at least five different peaks here. That's not necessarily five different dyes, but it shows a lot of information. Most dyes only have one or two peaks. Okay, this shows the other sample, what I call the jersey sample that I gave to Jeff. There were white fibers, I called them white, they were actually slightly pink, kind of a light blue fiber. These fibers were intended to be black and it looks that way in the photograph, but actually one was, I pronounced it mauve, but all my colleagues insisted it's pronounced mauve, but the dictionary says that I'm right. <laughs> uh, and the other one is kind of a slate gray color. And this shows the spectrum. This is the white fiber here. It shows a little bit of, of uh, peaking right here. That's probably because the uh, peak illumination of the quartz halogen lamp that we use in the microscope is right about at 560. But otherwise it's fairly flat. The blue fiber here this one's the slate fiber, and then this one's the mauve fiber, or mauve fiber. What it looks like from these curves they did is they first dyed the fibers blue, then they dyed a few other fibers on top of the blue with the, uh, with the mauve, and then finally the slate, just from the additional of uh, curves that are here. So it looks like it was a succession of dying one after the other. And this shows the numerical printout. What am I comparing? The mauve to the slate. Uh, these are both supposed to be black. By reflected light they looked black. But there's a difference here in uh, daylight of about 27 which is uh, easily detectable by the eye. Um, just as a matter of information, the numbers here, the uh, chromaticity coordinates, uh, can be converted into Munsell notation. There's an ASTM method that can convert the chromaticity CIE numbers into Munsell notation. If you're more used to that nomenclature. This shows the uh, blue and the slate being compared. Shows a difference here of 51. Quite a lot of difference. And this finally shows the white 
compared to the slate, and it shows a difference of about 47, or almost 47, 46.7. Um, this sort of has to do with fibers. Um, in bank robbery cases, they have what are called die packs that contain an explosive charge with um, tear gas and a red dye. There's two red dyes that are used. One is rhodamine B, the other is uh, methyl amino anthraquinone. And uh, this one in particular doesn't have much use except in military tracer uh, to see where your bullet is going. So we find this dye on the person's clothes or on dollar bills that shows that he was exposed to one of these bank dye pads. just shows the numerical values that you get with the methyl amino anthraquinone. This is what I was experimenting with, the la different laundry soaps and the fluorescence. I'm getting a slight shift here between the tide and surf detergents. There's a little peak here that doesn't show up in the tide. Right now, I'm working with the pure detergents until I can see enough differences. I have the conditions right. Then I can look at individual fibers and see if I can see those same differences. It's something I'm still working on. I think that's the end, right? Yeah, that's it. Um, so that's the end of my presentation on the microspectrophotometer. I have some of the charts, that I, the hard copies that uh, I made up if you want to look at those. And uh, Jeff can talk about his analysis of the dyes by thin layer chromatography. Well, I guess we can see if there's any questions, right? Nobody has any questions. So we'll well, turn the lights on first of all. As Jim was saying, I'm Jeff. <laughs> and uh, what I did was I took the fibers that he had sent me uh, from the, uh, the ski mask and uh, basically extracted them using a combination of pyridine and water and stick them in an oven at 100 degrees for about a half an hour and uh, spotted them on TLC plates and ran them. Uh, I also ran the other fibers that he mentioned uh, from the jersey uh, all together and basically I ran it on two different systems if you look at the handout on page 20 or the page that's numbered 22 on the handout which by the way is a, a compilation Sandy Worsman did in 1984 it was published in the CAC newsletter back in March of 84 uh, there's two TLC systems listed for acrylic uh, fibers and one is chloroform isopropyl alcohol, pyridine, acetic acid and water, and the other one is uh, chloroform, methyl ethyl ketone, acetic acid and formic acid. And uh, I'll just hold these up so everybody can see them. See here. And the one on the, uh, we can see the all the different spots and more or less the center column, that's the, uh, the uh, uh, watch cap fibers. And as you can see, there's uh, six different spots there. Uh, you've got basically a, a sort of an orangish brown, I guess, uh, two different shades of what looks like a pink, uh, almost a turquoise, and then a, a blue and a purple. Uh, so you've got six, at least six different dyes in this thing. And you can see, uh, looking at the two plates, uh, how they, they TLC a little bit differently on the two systems. Uh, on my right is the uh, uh, all the fibers lumped together from the jersey and you can see the system on the right which is the uh, chloroform, methyl ethyl ketone, acetic acid and formic acid it doesn't move those very much at all because this, this particular plate was allowed to run until the solvent front got almost all the way to the top and it doesn't you can see there's virtually no movement 
uh, if you look at the other one on the on my left, which is the chloroform, uh, propanol, and pyridine, and acetic acid and water, uh, you can see that even though that was only run about two thirds of the way up the plate, it separated out. Uh, now let's say about one, two, three, about six, uh, six or seven different uh, components. Now, granted, that was four different types of fibers, uh, but you can see the differences that you get. Uh, with the two systems, and obviously if you, if you have enough that you can run both systems, you're going to have some pretty good discrimination. Uh, speaking of having enough, uh, each of these was run using a tuft of fibers, not just an individual fiber. And generally speaking, uh, that's kind of what you need, uh, except when you get into carpet fibers and things like that, you might be able to get away with getting uh, a TLC on, on an individual fiber or something like that. Uh, I know a couple times that I've done it in the past have been like on a hit and run where maybe somebody gets run over by a car or something and you've got little bits of their clothing or little tufts of fibers uh, from their clothing adhering to the undercarriage of the vehicle and things like that. You can have some pretty good success that way. Uh, basically, I've used uh, these little capillary tubes that we have. Uh, the tricky part is getting the fibers inside the tube uh, well basically what you do is just stuff, get, if you can, get the fibers stuffed inside the tubing and uh, then you stick it down just like you're going to TLC a, a drug sample or something and suck up some of your solvent, which uh, I just use one of the extraction solvents that's mentioned in here. What you've got to do initially is identify your fiber type because whether it's an acrylic or a nylon or a polyester or whatever is going to generally determine uh, what type of dye, whether it's an acid dye or a basic dye or whatever, uh, the manufacturer is going to use to treat it. Uh, so you figure out what you've got as far as a generic class, and then you can go to this reference, which I've been using for years, and that'll tell you what sort of an extraction solvent to use and the temperature to do the extraction at. Anyway, you get the fibers in there, uh, pull up some of the solvent, uh, invert it and tap it, and get the solvent down to where the fibers are in the middle, and then just uh, use, for these little ones, just an alcohol lamp is enough to seal both ends. And then you stick it in the oven at the appropriate, the listed temperature for like a half an hour or something like that. Uh, the other thing that's mentioned in, in this article, which is not a good thing to do, is uh, use the fibers, uh, one with the extraction solvent and then another one with just plain water. And that way you can compare them side by side and you can see whether or not the dye is actually extracting into the solvent. Uh, Obviously, the, the idea is you work with uh, your known fibers, uh, your known garments or whatever ahead of time because you've got lots of stuff to play with. And like in this case here, for example, on acrylics, they list three different uh, extraction solvents. And you, you're going to want to try different extraction solvents and that sort of thing to uh, see what's going uh, to pull all the dyes out. And then you can try the different TLC systems to see which one's going to give you the best separation and stuff. Uh, the other thing that I was fooling around with this morning, because I was getting very frustrated, because <laughs> I don't do this very often, getting very frustrated with getting the fibers to go inside the little bitty tube, uh, was I use these things, which are uh, micro blood collection tubes. Uh, and I had some pretty good success with these, and I'll just kind of show you what I did with those. It's kind of fun. Uh, when you've got a knit material, they're invariably, uh, when you take them apart, if you ever peeled apart a t-shirt or anything like that, they just have this wonderful little accordion effect and it's really hard to get it to go anywhere. Uh, but what I did, obviously you don't want to hunt it with your bare hands, but uh, just take some of this and these tubes, like I said, are nice and big. They're a millimeter and a half uh, inside diameter. And so it's real easy to stick the fibers inside, especially if you have nice sharp forceps. And then I've got my, uh, for those of you that have been to my chrome classes, I've got my tungsten needle, except this is my dull tungsten needle, and push it down somewhere near the middle. And I'll save you the uh, smell of uh, pyridine and water, which is what I usually use. This is just plain water for demonstration purposes. 
and basically you just get it in there and get uh, however much water you think you're going to need. And then turn it the other way and uh, basically the water, as I just tap it, the water's running down to the fibers. Unfortunately, since it's, there's no organic solvent in there, it's not wetting them very well. But uh, anyway, so what I've got now is this tube that's open at both ends with the fibers in the middle and, and the solvent in contact with the fibers. And just heat it up to close one of the ends. I usually check it under a stereoscope because sometimes it'll close all except for just a little bit and you stick it in the oven and you boil away all your solvent. Uh, obviously I don't have a stereoscope here but that's the idea, is flame it closed. I'm going to cool down enough that I can handle it. Okay. And then just go on the other side. And heat it up enough. I'm blowing on it. And just stretch it out. And then again, let it cool off a little bit. Then I've got a, hopefully a sharp triangle file. Although you don't need to do that at this stage. There it went. And then go back. And now that I've got this, which is all sealed at one end and tapered down at the other end but still open, and just go back in here. And seal that. Okay. And then you can take this little assembly and stick it in the stick it in the oven at 100 degrees or 135 degrees or whatever it calls for for half an hour, an hour, or something like that, and and then check it. Uh, and then all you do when you want to uh, once the solvents extracted the uh, the water separated a little bit. There you go. So I had to knock it back down so it was in contact. Uh, and then all you do is just score it with the file at the top and then uh, down here at the bottom you want it to break fairly cleanly so you can spot it on a TLC plate uh, and then you can just sit there once the top's open and the bottom's open you can just sit there and tap it and you get the solvent to go all the way down and then you can make nice little teeny tiny uh, TLC spots with the the fine point and that way you don't get nearly so frustrated to trying to get the curvy fibers and the little teeny tiny uh, capillary tubes. These, like I said these are kind of small uh, I've not had good success with ordering capillary tubes that are, are big bores, but uh, that's basically uh, all I did. And like I said, as you can see, you can get a lot of information from the TLC because we had uh, you know six different spots from what was essentially just a, a single, what looked like a single color. And as you can see by the uh, the specter that Jim put up there, there was a lot of stuff going on. And that's a, this is a, like I said, this is a, a wonderful handout, and hopefully everybody got a copy of it that uh, Sandy put together, and uh, that's basically about all I've had to say. For the solvent to go back and forth across your fibers, and that mechanical action will help extract the fibers. Yeah. That's a good point. I'm sure you've done a lot more of this than I have. Have you tried the uh, the high performance uh, TLC plates? Uh, no, I just use the I generally just use the same things that we use for uh, Narco and stuff like that. Uh, they're just plain old. Uh, mm -hmm. name it, yeah. Just plain old silica gel. These happen to have a uh, what's it 254 nanometer uh, fluorescent dye in or something. Yeah, that's another good point. It's always good to look at it under the UV light 
because of the optical bright brightness, will also be show spots on the TLC plate. So do you want to use a fluorescent plate then? Or do you want to I use would, I would. Use a non-fluorescent plate. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Generally, the, your spots, your optical brighteners, are going to be fluorescing at the long wave UV, and the and your dye, your fluorescent dyes are usually under short wave UV light. So there's generally not interference. But just for sensitivity, I think you can get. Um, what do I say? You can see the spots easier if you didn't have the dye, the fluorescent dye there.